glad this morning that we have a God that's a way maker. Amen. Do y'all believe that this morning? That God can make a way out of no way. He can turn your, your situation, your circumstance around really quickly. Amen. There's nothing that's impossible with him or nothing he can't do. And uh, this morning it is so good to be here. So good to have you here with us this morning. Our Sunday morning worship time. And I'm glad that uh, to see some of you. I haven't seen you recently because of sickness and surgery and all kinds of things. But it is such a blessing to have you with us. Your guest with us this morning. Thank God for you. We are glad you're here. We don't take it for granted. We realize this morning that you probably passed quite a few churches on your way here today. And we are glad that you chose to be with us. Amen. And we are glad that God led you here. And I have been my prayer all week that God would bless you through something that is said or done. Um, through the singing. And I know you're more blessed because I didn't sing. So that's already a plus. Amen. <laughs> and so it is good to be here. I know the weather has changed. Amen. We've had a transformation in the weather. Uh, the weather has shifted. And we are into what feels like we went from summer to winter. I don't know if we had much of a fall. Uh, though we went from summer to winter, and so we're there in the cold season, and I hope that you are enjoying that because it looks like we're stuck. I say that, but then next week is supposed to be about 60 again, so keep your shorts handy, amen, is all I know to tell you, and that way you can choose what you're wearing. Used to, when I was younger, we put up our summer clothes and bring out our winter clothes and vice versa, um, but now you almost just have to leave it out year-round, you know, you can keep a drawer with tank tops and and shorts and the rest of it winter. So uh, I'm glad to be here this morning. I'm glad you're here. And uh, this morning I'm excited. We kind of accidentally stumbled upon a series that's called Happy Thanksgiving. I did one message that led to another message that led to another message. And they're all kind of centered around this because I think God really desires for you to have a great Thanksgiving this, this year. Um, and I believe that he wants you to have a happy day every day. Uh, I'm not saying there won't be struggles, but in the midst of our struggles, you know, I was thinking this week, Paul said, I count it all joy when I, when I go through things. Amen. When I struggle, he said, I count it a joy, especially if I'm struggling for Jesus. He said, I count it a joy. And I know that's hard language. It's like, really, Paul? I mean, what kind of guy are you? You like the Terminator for Christ or something, you know? But, but the thing is that Paul said that. And the reason he said that is because he realized that even though I'm in a struggle, I know who I can count on to get me out of the struggle. And I know this is temporary, and it's only going to last for a season, and I'm coming out the other side. And so I believe that God really wants you, no matter what your situation, no matter what your circumstance, I believe he wants you to have a good Thanksgiving this Thanksgiving season. And so this morning as we get into this text, I want to open with a, uh, with a little bit of a story if I can. I like to share some of my life with all of you so you get to know me a little better. And... Um, I can't speak for anybody else. I shared this with a group the other night. I can't speak for anybody else, and I'm not knocking anybody else, but in my opinion, and I am biased to a certain degree, but in my opinion, my grandmother, she's deceased now, she's in heaven with Jesus, but my grandmother made the best chocolate pie earth has ever tasted. Okay? It was phenomenal. And I have family members that try to mimic my grandmother's uh, chocolate pie. It just can't be done. Okay. Now my grandmother did dip snuff, and we're not too sure that woman didn't slide in the pie. I don't know, but the thing is, is that they, you just cannot replicate this chocolate pie. Okay, and it's just phenomenal. And so after I moved away several years ago to the mountains, it was at Thanksgiving one year, and, and she found out I was coming. Well, I found out that while I had been gone, Grandma had not made any chocolate pies, and the family was kind of just, you know. A little upset with Grandma because she hadn't made chocolate pie. But she knew it was one of my favorites. And so when she found out I was coming home, Grandma was like, well, I'll make some chocolate pie. So, of course, it was the rule then that I had to come every Thanksgiving so everybody could get chocolate pie. But the problem was is that when we would have Thanksgiving dinner, we would have a spread. Because we've got a huge family on that side. And we'd have a spread of food. And there were people, <clears throat> won't name any names, that would make sure they got their slice of chocolate pie. There would be arguments about just don't even cut the pie, let's just keep it for ourselves, but you wanted to make sure you got the whole piece. I didn't want to go and just get a little bit of pudding here or a little bit of crumbs there. I wanted to make sure I got a whole 
And when I say whole piece, some of you ladies are like, yeah, cut me a sliver. No, I'm like, cut me a chunk. Amen. I want a piece of the pie. Amen. I want my piece in the pie. And the reason I share that is because Thanksgiving can be stressful. Is anybody stressed yet? Some of you are, some of you aren't, amen. You're already thinking about all these people piling in your house, and some of you are already thinking, what if I got to shove them in the closet and under your bed to make sure it looks good and, and make sure everything's clean and tidy, and some of you have people coming in town, some of you are going out of town, there's a lot of things going on, and so it's getting into that season where people are starting to get stressed a little bit about the holidays and about all the activities with the holidays. And then you have uh, those that are just stressed because they're looking at, uh, now this stresses me out, Black Friday, amen, and so, you know, Black Friday is just, it shouldn't even be there, it shouldn't even be a day, all right, that's just ridiculous, okay, for people to line up in the cold to get into a store to buy something because they save a few dollars and kill people to do it, that's ridiculous, okay, so the thing is that it can be a very stressful type of season. Now, what about those of you that on top of that, you already struggle with anxiety? <coughs> Just every day, throughout the year. Or maybe some events have happened this year that's caused you to struggle with anxiety, especially when it comes to Thanksgiving. You're like, I would love to have a happy Thanksgiving, Pastor. But I just don't know if I can because I'm struggling so bad with anxiety and, and anxiousness over this and how this is going to go and how is this going to play out that I don't even know if I can even enjoy this Thanksgiving season. Well, this morning I titled the message a little different than what I'm going to teach on because I just wanted to talk about my grandma's pie. But this morning let's jump into the text and it's going to come out of Philippians chapter 4. And in Philippians chapter 4, we're going to read verses 4 through 7. I hope if you have your Bible, you'll open them with me and read with me. But if you don't, look on the screen. The Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always. And Paul says, well, let me just make sure you heard me. And again, I say, rejoice. He goes on to say, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God. That's what we're trying to get to this Thanksgiving, right? The peace of God. That passes all understanding. Shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So we see it really that I'm saying I want the whole peace. P-E-A-C-E. -E. I want the whole peace. In other words, this holiday season, I want to have peace. I want to have peace with myself. I want to have peace with God. I want to have peace with the family. I don't want to be worried and concerned and in turmoil. I don't want to be stressed out. I don't want to be anxious. I just want to have peace. And I don't want just a little crumb. I want the whole piece, just like I did with Grandma's pie. And so this morning, if I, if I retitled this, I would give it some answer, uh, answers. <laughs> so, <laughs> where did that come from? <laughs> Golly! Hey, I want to give you some answers. Answers. Sorry, the redneck comes out every now and then. I want to give you some answers to anxiety. All right? Answers to anxiety. Ooh, who wants to read that book? Answers. Amen. <laughs> Answers to anxiety. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your blessing. God, we thank you for the word of God. I'm glad there is an answer to every situation. God, I'm glad this morning that you can help us and guide us and give us peace in the midst of our struggle. And God, this morning, I know there's people here that have problems, real problems. God, I know there's people here who are in, in the midst of a storm. I know there's people here who are struggling. I know there's people here who deal every day of their life waking up with anxiety, going to bed with anxiety. And God, we're not downplaying that in no way, shape, or form. But I believe you have some answers for all of us this morning that can help us. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray right now you move in every pew, every aisle, sit down with every person. And God, I pray that this message would be relevant to their life in some form or fashion. God, we thank you. We thank you for being a way maker. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. So if I go back and I recap a little bit, the Bible says that Paul opens the text we're reading this morning in verse 4, and he says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now, he's already starting with a concept, right? He's already starting with a concept saying, don't be worried. Don't be so consumed with what's going on in your life that you forget to praise God. Right. Amen? And so what we find is that this is a phenomenal statement when you understand the scenario that Paul's in. Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians from jail. Paul's in jail, and Paul's saying, rejoice. You know? He's like, I'm locked up. I've got guards over me. I'm probably in shackles and chains. They've given me a a writing utensil and and a piece of paper or parchment, and I'm writing you this letter, and in the midst of this letter, I say, rejoice. And again, let me just emphasize that it's like Paul putting a huge three exclamation points on the end of it. And again, I say, rejoice. Rejoice. So what is Paul saying? He says, I'm telling you to praise God. And I think that there's people right here this morning that you're in your own prison. Maybe not physically, but emotionally and mentally and spiritually, you are in a type of prison that you feel bound and chained and in shackles, you feel like you're in the midst of the worst storm of your life. And when you look ahead to a week or so from now and you say, man, you know, I mean, it's right here on us and and I'm getting anxiety and I'm getting worried and I'm getting depressed and I'm getting discouraged and I feel defeated and I just don't, I feel deflated. I just do not feel like this is going to be a good Thanksgiving for me and my family. Paul says, hey, take a breath and praise him. I know it feels like you're in prison. I know it feels like you have nothing to shout over, but realize you do. You've got so much to praise him for. I had somebody ask me the other week, uh, they did this a year or so ago, and they said, can we, can me and my family sing this song again? And it's, it's a song talking about God's blessings on us around Thanksgiving. And it's a great song. It's an encouraging song. It's a Southern Gospel song. For those who listen to Southern Gospel, it talks about, uh, thank you, Lord. Not thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me, but I've been so blessed. And it talks about all the blessings we have. We have hands that we can raise and, and mouths that we can use and all these things. And, and sometimes we get our focus, and I told on this the other week, we get our focus on our problem versus on the problem solver and the way maker and the miracle worker and the promise keeper and the light in the darkness. I mean, that's my God. Amen. And, and so the thing is, is that it's easy to do because when I, when, I, when I have a problem right in front of me, that's all I can see. Right. It's all I can see. But the Bible says if I have grain as a faith of mustard seed, I can say to my problem, be away from me. Right. And it'll be away from me. And now I can see the big picture. Or let's think about it like this. If my problem's in front of me, the psalmist said I look up to the hill. Right. In other words, if I keep looking at my problem, my problem's going to look back at me and talk back to me and, and have a conversation with me and show me how big it is. But if I look up and look up to the hills, the hills where it comes my help, my help comes from the Lord, then I can begin to realize, hey, the problem isn't as big as I thought it was. There's somebody above my problem. And so this morning, Paul says, even though I'm in prison, I, I, I encourage you to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord, in the Lord. I might not get to rejoice in my circumstance. My circumstance is real and it hurts and it's painful and it's a prison. And I can't rejoice in my circumstance, but I can rejoice in the one who's over my circumstance. In the Lord. In the Lord. And so we find that he says rejoice. And so we find that the situation Paul's in in the prison, we find he's in a physical restraint and a restriction. And maybe this morning you don't feel physically restrained. But emotionally, you're restrained. You, you suffered some emotional trauma this year. And emotionally, you're restrained, and you feel like you're, you're, you're in chains and in fetters emotionally. Mentally, you're restrained. You're like, it's just not going to be the same. I can't get past it. I just can't move on. And so anxiety begins to creep in. Worry begins to creep in. The struggle becomes real, really quick. Or maybe this is that season where it feels like you're restricted and I can't, I 
can't move past a certain point. This is as far as I can go. It's like I have some freedom. This is as far as I can go. This morning, I believe God wants to help you break free. He wants to be the chain breaker. He wants to break the chains in your life so that you can have a happy Thanksgiving. Does anybody here want to have a happy Thanksgiving? So we see praise. What is praise? Praise, I would define as an action. Or even, to go a little further, maybe a reaction. Praise is basically me giving God thanks for what he has done. That's praise. And so when you think about praise, it's, it's for example, for example, I can say this morning, I praise God for my hand. Right? And I can praise him with my hand. I can raise my hand. I can praise him with my hand. I can thank him for my hand. I can give God praise for having hands that move and function and, and work. But it's God that gave me hands that move and function and work, and that's why I praise him. And the Bible simply says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So that means saved people, lost people, Christian people, Buddhist people, satanic people, anybody that's alive and has breath, let everything, not just people, everything. How many of you saw the picture I shared on Facebook the other day of the squirrel smelling the flower? Wasn't that cool? I looked at that and I said, man, that's a preacher thanking the Creator by stopping and smelling a flower. That's awesome. I didn't even know squirrels smell flowers. I thought all they did was tear up my stuff. Right? Kind of makes you feel bad for those who are killing the squirrels. Don't it? You just killed the squirrel because he got in your flower bed and he was just trying to smell the flowers God created. Man, you don't have to answer for that. All right? Hey, listen. The thing is this morning is that is that the Bible says that to everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise you, the Lord. In other words, God gave you breath. If you've got breath, you say, yeah, but my breath comes from a machine. God gave the people the knowledge to make the machine. It gave you breath. If you've got breath, he says, praise him. He says, praise him. If I've got breath in my lungs, it's he that gave me breath. I should praise him. If I've got blood in my veins, it's him that gave me blood. I should praise him. And the problem is we have problems. But Paul says here, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. He says, praise the Lord in the midst of your problems. Praise the Lord in the midst of your prison. Praise the Lord in the midst of your struggle. Praise the Lord in the midst of your storm. Praise the Lord in the midst of your, your pain and in the midst of your process. Praise Him. Don't let it go without being noticed that I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. The Bible says this is the day the Lord has made. I will. I will rejoice. And be glad in it. He didn't say I woke up this way. He didn't say I woke up and everything was just hunky dory in life and everything was smooth sailing and there was every cloud was out of the sky and the sun was shining bright and there was rainbows and unicorns and butterflies and all this stuff. He said, listen, he said, the problem is, is that I woke up with problems, but I will choose. Right, right. Paul says, I woke up in prison, but I will choose. To praise God because he deserves my praise. You see, the problem is, is that for those dealing with worry and concern and struggle and anxiety and their mental and emotional prisons, this is your issue. Is that when you shut up, it wins. When you close your mouth, it wins. You say, that, that's kind of a foolish thought. I think it is too, and I think it's foolish that God would tell the children of Israel under the guidance of Joshua to walk around the walls yeah. and shut up. Yeah. He said, just walk. Walk around these walls. He said, but when you get around on the seventh time, when anxiety has had its say, and you're thinking about those soldiers up on that wall, and you're thinking about how they're going to kill you, and you're thinking about how in the world we, we don't have 
battle armories and we don't have all these things to bust through the wall. How are we even going to get in this city and get to Canaan, the place God promised? I'm concerned. I'm worried. My wife is with me. My children are with me. Who's going to protect them? God says, don't worry about any of that. Just trust me. And when I tell you to, I want you to open your mouth and let out a shout of praise because when you do that, the walls are going to fall. And on that seventh time around, in that seventh step, they blew those trumpets and they shouted to God in praise, rejoicing over what he was going to do, but they had not seen done yet. And in that moment, the walls fell. You say, preacher, what's that got to do with me? Thanksgiving isn't here yet. But I would encourage you to walk around it in some prayer. And say, God, I'm believing and trusting and knowing that it's coming. But I believe you're going to make it good. I believe you're going to make it great. You're going to destroy every enemy that will come against me this Thanksgiving. Doubt, depression, discouragement, oh, the dread and the fear, all those things, God. I believe it. And I shout it right now in praise to God, believing that you're going to do something great this year in my Thanksgiving. You see, you've got to open up your mouth and give God praise. Amen. And Paul says rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Good. He said, but preacher, you don't understand. Let me ask you a simple question. Are you grieving? If not, you can't answer. So I'm not even worried about it. <laughs> but if you are, I encourage you, praise his name. Yeah. Praise his name. It's amazing to me the things we will open our mouth and shout about. And then the thing we should shout about, we shut up over. It's crazy. It's amazing to me how we get so focused on something that is temporary instead of focusing on something that's eternal like the goodness of God. Right. We sing a song here sometimes called, He's a Good, Good Father. That's who you are. And this morning, I believe he's good. I don't just believe he's good. I believe he's great, the Bible says. He's Amen. greatly to be praised. Amen. Amen. And so this morning, I encourage you, try to muster it. Find what you can praise him for. If you focus on what you have lost or what you have not or what you have struggled with or whatever, then that's going to be your focus. It's time to refocus. It's time to change your mentality and renew your mind. And as you do that, you begin to understand that, hey, hey, there's some good things in my life. There's some good things in my life today. And if I have nothing else in my life, if I've got Jesus, we used to sing the song, he's more precious than silver and gold and all these things. But then when we lose all the things, we're like, oh, I get it, it hurts, and it's painful, and it's a struggle. But if I've got Jesus, don't I have anything? That's kind of what Job said. He said, you give, you take away, but blessed be your name. And in the end, he says, as long as I've got you, I don't know a lot, but I know that at the last day, I'll stand, and my Redeemer lives, and I'll stand with him. And even though worms made this flesh, I'll stand with my Redeemer at the last day. He says, though you slay me, get the lie. morning I encourage you because what we find is Paul goes on and he says there's a progression in this because he starts to rejoice but look at verse 6 he says be careful now the actual word there careful in the Greek actually means anxious don't be anxious don't be anxious over anything now that's easily said isn't it? easily said it's, it's getting I'll, I'll, can I be honest this message is for me this morning it's not that I'm worried about Thanksgiving. That's not even a concern. This is even a, a strange thought to me because this is not normal for me. But last night as I was getting ready to go to sleep, I was considering that, man, in like a month, if everything goes to schedule, this book's going to be out. And my life might get a little busier and things might, you know, pick up and God might really be able to use me more and all this stuff. And I felt a little bit nervous. I was like, what am I nervous for? I never get nervous. But it's the unknown. It's the unknown. And the thing is, is that I, I had to hold this to myself. And I said, no, oh, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Be anxious for nothing. And so I applied this last night to my life. And I want you to apply it to yours today. And the thing is, the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. But by prayer, prayer. What is prayer? Prayer is a broad spectrum. Prayer is my communication with God. 
Prayer is my way of just talking to God, hearing from God. It's my way of communicating in general with God. Prayer is something we all can do in this room together, or it's something we can do apart. But then he goes a step further. He says, not just by prayer, not just by talking to God, but by supplication. What is the word supplication? Well, I should have brought you an example, but you can imagine with me. How many of you have ever seen a funnel? Or oil in your car, or whatever the funnel. And so the thing is, that the funnel is top. That's prayer. At the bottom, it's real small and specific. It's going to design, it's designed to put the big top into something very specific so that it can give it something. So that it can have a deposit of something. A funnel is not made to withdraw at all. A funnel is made to deposit. Amen? And what God is saying through Paul here is, I want you to put your funnel right on the spot you need it. That's causing you anxiety. Right? In other words, if you feel weak, if you feel weak in this area of your life, you put the funnel right there. And I want you to pray to me. It's broad. Just pray. Start talking to me. Pray to me. He said, but as you pray to me, I want you to get real specific. And I want you to say, God, you know I'm hurting right here this year. You know this part of my life is struggling so bad. And I need you to make a deposit right there. Amen. It's like if you have more than one bank account, you have to choose which one is getting the money. And then you might have a bank account, a savings account, a CD. You have to say, okay, where's the money going? Amen? And you go say, hey, I'm going to put this here and that there. You're getting real specific about where the money is going, about where the deposit is going. Amen? And so this morning, I want you to understand that in this funnel concept, Paul says, hey, I want you by prayer and by supplication, let your request be made known unto God. So we find that we're requesting something from God. And I find so many people in the church today are dealing with worry and anxiety and struggle because they feel it's wrong to ask God for anything. But Paul says, ask. Can I go a step further and go, you say, yeah, but Paul was a man. Well, let's go to Jesus. Jesus said, ask, and it shall be given. Knock, and the door will be opened. Seek, and you will find. Jesus said, hey, we're wanting to bless you. We're wanting to funnel this thing down to you and meet your needs and meet your desires. But the problem is you're not asking for it. Right. He says you have not because you ask not. This morning I encourage you. What is it you need to get you to be happy this Thanksgiving? You say, hey, I need it, preacher. I really would like to have it, but I just, I mean, I'm finding reasons to praise him, but this prayer and supplication thing. Can I remind you, the Bible says he's able to do it seating, abundant, above all you ask or think. Our problem is we limit God. We say, God, you can, but you won't. Or God, I don't know. And we find that here, God is teaching us through Paul. He says, hey, praise God even in your prison. Even in your prison, praise Him. He says, how do you do that? Not only by praising, but by prayer and supplication. Pray to me and point me in the direction where you need the help the most. You say, but doesn't God already know? He does. He does. But let me ask you a question. For those with kids, don't you know your kid's going to get hungry? So you buy groceries. You've got them there, right? But then you're just hanging out at the house, football games on. I don't even know i got kids anymore. You know? I'm a man. My box is open. Football. Right? So I'm watching football. Let me, let me make it real for you in my scenario. Christian, when she was little, this is my youngest daughter, she used to wake up before we would in the morning. And Christian was like waking up like a hungry little monster. You know, I mean, I don't know what she did in her sleep. I've never been the, the person that as soon as I woke up, I wanted food, but Christian did at that age. And Christian would come walking into the bedroom, stand in the doorway, and you'd hear her say, Mom, Dad, I'm hungry. You know? It's like, finally I had to teach her when she got older, okay, well here's the bowl, here's the spoon, here's the cereal, here's the milk, help yourself, I'm sleeping. I'm sleepy, all right? 
The thing is, is that, that I had to get her to understand that, hey, if you want it, it's here for you. I, I've provided your need. If you want it, just go get it. And, and still, though, she would ask a lot of times, well, Daddy, can I have this? Daddy, can I have that? Yeah, you can have it. Go get it. And I think that we misinterpret that with God. God says, I, God, I love. The Bible says, I, I'll meet all your needs according to my riches, not my, not my poverty, my riches and glory. And he says, you can boldly come into the throne of grace. And Jesus says, ask and it shall be given. Knock and you shall be opened. Seek and you shall find. And so we find that we're sitting down here this Thanksgiving season saying, boy, I'd really like to be happy. But I just don't know how to get happy. Jesus says, just praise me and pray to me and point me where you need happiness. And I'll help you Amen. to be happy this Thanksgiving. Yeah. And this morning we find that he goes a step further, though. And he goes into it and he says, listen. He says, by prayer and supplication, with Thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now, doesn't it seem a little redundant that he would say rejoice and then say Thanksgiving? Especially if it's the same kind of concept. <laughs> but I told you, praising... Praising God is an action or a reaction to what God has done for us. Thanksgiving is an attitude. It's not just an action that I say. I like to say it as thanks living. You know, thanks living. I'm not just going to give you thanks. I'm going to live it. I'm going to let you know how thankful I am. You know, it's one thing for somebody to say thank you. I remember when I was made to say thank you when I was a kid. Anybody else knew their kids like that? Somebody give you something like in church? You know, you've got the seasoned saints that'll carry the candy with them. <laughs> Amen. Or some preachers, I'm not that one, but some preachers like always had the candy with them and they're like, here you go, sweetheart. You know? And mom and daddy be like, you say thank you. And you sit there like, I just want this candy. But thank you. It's good manners, right? Thank somebody for what they gave you. Thank somebody for what they've done for you. And, and what you find is if you adopt a lifestyle of thanksgiving, you don't have to be told to thank. It's just, it's just natural. And so the Bible says, enter into his courts with thanksgiving, into his gates with praise. And so this morning we have to understand that when we enter into God's gates and his courts, he says, come in with praise and thanksgiving. Why did he separate them? Because it's two separate things. One's an attitude. One is a, 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 an action. Amen? And so we go into it and we understand that. And here's the thing about this, because when we talk about Thanksgiving, I want you to understand, Satan cannot curse what God has blessed. Have you ever thought about that? Satan can't curse what God has blessed. Do you believe you're blessed? Amen. I got a few. Do you really believe you're blessed? Amen? Amen? Then you've got to realize this morning that Satan can't curse what God has blessed. To say that would be to say, Satan has power God over God. Amen? Satan can't curse what God has blessed. He can only cause you to not be appreciative and instead be anxious and worried about losing what God has already gave you. It's a good little thought, man. In other words, think of it like this. God has gave me joy. It's a fruit of the Spirit. I have to have it. Somewhere. Right? Somewhere in there, I've got joy. We used to sing a song, I got joy, 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 down in my heart. Down deep in my heart. So maybe that's what's that. Down deep. I was told it was down deep, so I left it down deep. It's down deep in my heart. Amen? So that's where it's at. But I understand by my knowledge in God that I have joy. And Satan says, I'm going to steal your joy. Now, biblically, he can't because God gave it to him. <coughs> the only way he can steal it is if I let him. Right. So he's spending his time. Think about this. In the Garden of Eden, I'm trying to hurt. In the Garden of Eden, Satan <laughs> could not just come and take the rights to this earth. Right. He couldn't. He couldn't just come and pronounce a curse on that need. Why? Because God had blessed them. The only way they could lose the blessing was to give it up. Was to give it up. And this morning, God is telling me to tell you, hey, the only way you can lose your blessing this Thanksgiving is to give it up. 
Amen. It's like my slice of chocolate pie. I will kill you. I will stab you in the throat with this spoon. Amen. Don't play with me. Not even a fork. I will dig a crater in your neck with this spoon if you try to take my grandma's chocolate pie from me. I love you. God forgive me and forgive you. Amen. It's done. I'm telling you now, you ain't getting my grandma's chocolate pie. If my daughter came up to me, baby, I love you. But you can't have it. Okay. <laughs> listen, listen, I would really share with my daughter probably. Maybe. But the thing is, the thing is, I want you to understand this because this is the issue. We pray and we trust God to bring the thing that we want, but then we don't trust Him to keep it and we get anxious right. over it. We say, God, bring me this person in my life, and God brings them, then we worry about losing the person. Why are you worried if you think God's wrong? God, bring me this job, and then you stress out every day, I'm going to lose the job. If you do the job, you can't lose the job. If God brought it to you, he'll keep it with you. The problem is Satan begins to whisper in your ear them lies and them deceits. And he says, oh, you're going to lose it. Oh, you're not going to keep it. Oh, you're not good enough. Oh, God didn't mean to give it to you. Da, 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 da. And then you're like, oh, my God. And you begin to say, hey, 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 I'm, I'm losing my grip. Well, maybe that's the problem. You're trying to hold on to it. And God says, just let me hold it for you. I got it. It's like when my kids were small and they would get money. I'd be like, here you go. Birthday party, here you go. As they got older, they said, no, nah, daddy, I got it. <laughs> I'd be like, what? I mean, I never stole your money. But the thing is, is that I would keep it because I knew if I put it in my pocket versus their little four-year-old pocket, it's going to be safe. I've understood God. He keeps. Matter of fact, Jesus said this about us. God, keep those you put in my hand. If he yeah. can keep me, don't you think he can keep yeah. right. anything he brings to me? Yeah. And the problem is we get anxious and worried and concerned and overwhelmed about all these things. And so we find a progression here because Paul has said, hey, praise God. Thank him as a reaction to what he's done for you. <laughs> Pray to God. Let him know that you need pinpointed accuracy in this prayer with supplication. Thank God. Make it a lifestyle. And then he says in verse 7, what we all want, right? And the peace of God. Peace of God. See, there's a lot of peace. And there's a lot of pieces. As a matter of fact, there's peace from God. And Paul continually talks about peace from God. He uses it, uses it as an introduction to his letters. And it reminds us that peace comes from God to us as a gift. There's peace with God. This describes the relationship we enter when we go into a relationship with Jesus. We now have peace with God. So there's peace from, uh, from God. There's peace with God. But here Paul uses a different phrase. And as a matter of fact, let me, before I say that, Jesus said there's peace of this world. But that's not the peace I give to you. I give you a different kind of peace. And that's the peace that we're getting into here. Because... There's peace of God. And that's the peace I want this Thanksgiving season. Is the peace. The whole peace. The whole peace. Because the peace of God makes me whole. The whole peace. Now you see what I did? The whole peace. And the thing is, is that this is the peace spoken of here. Beyond, look at what it says. Beyond all of our mind and our imagination. The Bible says the peace of God that passes all understanding. All understand. In other words, some people that are going to be around you this Thanksgiving, if you'll adopt this teaching this morning and apply it, they're going to look at you and say, with everything you've been through this year, I don't know how you so happy. Why don't you smile? I mean, I know that you're broken hearted and you, you should be in the same way and you're smiling. Right at the bottom of your rib cage, 
He's not going to examine you on your lifestyle and whether you're dead. He's going to pinpoint where your pain is. God says, I, I, I know where it's at. I know where it's at. I'm just asking for you to tell me where it hurts. Because I've got, I've got the medicine. I've got the prescription for your pain. I've got the prescription for your anxiety. The seat. I've got the answer. I just need you to make a make a call to the doctor. And the doctor can help you with that. You see, I love what it said as we wrap this up. It says, and the peace of God that passes all understanding, listen, shall keep your heart and your mind. How's it going to do that? Because when I lay down at night, my mind seems to race. It goes on all the negative things in my life. My heart hurts. We shared this text in class this morning. He had not a high priest. He was not the touch and feeling of our infirmities. Jesus. Jesus understands your pain. Jesus understands your hurt. He understands your mental anguish. And he said, hey, Paul, would you write a letter real quick to these people for me and tell them this? Would you tell them that the peace of God, the whole peace of God, that's going to blow their mind and they're not even going to be able to understand it mentally in their mental capacity or emotionally in their heart. But it will keep their hearts and minds this holiday season. I just need them to, to do something. And in closing, I'm going to share something that I do in counseling all the time. It's a method I came up with that God showed me, and it works. I've seen it work so much. And it's a simple three or four step method. And the first step is that I have to release what is bothering me. He said, prayer. Prayer has the idea of clinging something toward heaven. It's not a yo-yo that I tie a string to and I throw it and wait on it to come back. It's not a boomerang that I expect to come back flying to me. When I throw this, it's like a baseball that I'm clinging as hard as I can. Lord God, I'm saying, God, I can't deal with it. He said it like this. He said, cast your care on me because I care for you. Release it. But when I release it, I feel empty, right? I mean, there's nothing left. I had a ball in my hand. It was worry. It was concern. It was hurt. It was pain. But it was mine, and I had it. And now I feel all lonely without it, as crazy as that sounds. I would rather have the pain than feel empty. So what do I do? I say, God, let me receive. Let me receive something in place of that. That's where supplication comes in. God, here's what I need right here, right now, in this point of my life, at this point of my life, and I need you to fill it. That's why we can't withdraw from it. Some of you always did. Fill it. Hey, God, I'm going to give you anxiety. Will you give me peace? Right? Now, if you've ever heard me say this in a counseling session, you say, yeah, but preacher, what about that last one? Well, let me share it with you. It's in verse 8. It says, finally, brothers, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So that last step I teach them is that you have to replace or renew your mind. Paul said in Romans 12, too, that we have to renew our mind. We have to renew our mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so it's a real easy method. You say, preacher, I'm so overwhelmed already right now. I'm so anxious. I'm so struggling with my anxiety and my depression and my discouragement. I, it's real. I'm not downplaying it. What you deal with is real. But God sent me to tell you this season. 
that this could be your hope in the middle of your despair. What do I do, preacher? Believe. God, I need you. It's too heavy, it's too harmful, it's hurting me, it's killing me. I need your help. Hey, God, I don't want to feel empty. So in place with this hurt and pain, can you give me peace and joy? Hey, God, in the place of this loneliness, can you give me a feeling of love? And then you say, hey, I'm going to renew my mind. What am I going to do that with? I'm going to think about good things. And I'm going to get off the negative. I'm going to refocus. And I'm going to say, God, you know, I've got friends. God, you know, I've got family. God, you know, I've got a home. God, you know, I've got eyes that see. I've got ears that hear. I've got a voice that can talk. I've got feet that can walk. I've got hands that can walk. Start thinking about that. All the other stuff just kind of goes away. This morning, I really believe there's some people here that looking ahead to this holiday season, you're not happy and it's not even here yet. You're already dreading it. And truthfully, if I apply this in honesty, it should be every day. Not just this. But when we're coming into this season, as we're driving up on it and we see it on the horizon, I wonder if we're going to enter it with a smile and with joy. Or if we're going to enter it in the other way. What if I told you God said, the writing of Paul in Philippians 4, a lot of this stuff can be. You may not can help the chemical imbalances. You may not can help the, the disorders. But you can help your attitude. You can choose to think a little different. It ain't, it ain't easy. It's hard. But we can make a choice to change our minds. And he says, change your mind. Do those things above them. This morning, I don't know about you, and I know there's people here in worship, and I, I'm sorry, and I don't want to pray for you to hear you, but this morning, it's up to you. It's up to you. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, Paul and Silas applied this. They was in a prison house. And the Bible says they prayed, and they praised God. And the prison began to shake, and they broke free. So it's not just Paul writing words he doesn't understand. And can I tell you, I'm not just saying something I'm not trying myself. I've, I've applied this in my life. And I've watched God turn my weeping that endured for a night to joy in the morning. And the weeping was real and the pain was real. But I had to make up my mind I'm not going to stay still in this position, in this prison. This morning, if you're here and you say, you know, Pastor, this message has really hit home with me this morning. And I really could have used your prayers this holiday season that God would help me find peace this Sunday again. Would you raise your hand so I can pray for you? I see those hands. Is there anybody else that would be honest? I see those hands. Is there anybody else? Just be honest this morning. Maybe you're here and I see that hand. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know, Pastor, I... I don't know if I can ask Jesus to help me. You know, if I know the peace man. I don't know if I know Jesus in a personal way. I know about it, the blood of him, but I don't know if I've ever received him as my Lord and Savior. I can't say with full assurance this morning that I died today. I spent eternity in heaven. Listen, I don't want to embarrass you. I don't want to come to you. I don't want to touch you. I just want to pray for you. I don't even have to know your name. All I need you to do is raise your hand real quick. And I just want to pray for you. Say, I'm pretty sure I'm not sure. Christ as my Lord and my Savior. Can I pray for you? Would you let me do that? Would you just raise your hand real quick? As we stand to our feet this morning, if you need to cover this all, if you raise your hand, even if you didn't, and you have things that are hard and heavy on you, things that are hurting you this holiday season, why don't you come and lay it down? Why don't you lay it down and give it to Jesus this morning? Why don't you come and pray and say, Lord, I want to cast this on you. Why don't you do that three-step method? 
Do what, what I will do for you. Release it. Follow the hand and say, I'm going to receive it. And then begin to replace and renew your mind in a different way of thinking. Some have come. Why don't you come? I'm going to pray for you if you raise your hand. But you know what? There's nothing like you just trusting God yourself. And saying, God, I trust you. And that's really what it's about, isn't it? When I get anxious or get worried or get concerned and get overwhelmed, it's about I trust me more than I trust him. This morning, maybe you want to just come and maybe you just want to kneel and thank him. Maybe you want to live out that attitude of thanksgiving. You just want to kneel to him and thank him and say thank you, Lord, for your blessing. Thank you, God, for my health, my children, my mom, my dad. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you for breath in my lungs. Maybe this is one of those times where you don't even want to ask for anything. You just want to come and thank me. This altar is open if you want to come this morning.